Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Designing Organizations for Equitable Leadership panel. We have such a dynamic and exciting group of panelists here. I'm so excited for the conversation that we're about to have. A little bit of housekeeping at, for the Q&A when you're ready to ask your questions. There are mics already at your seats. It's a very high-tech room. You just tap these little round things, and when they turn green, the mic is on. So make sure you're not accidentally touching it during the panel, only for Q&A. <laughs> And just a brief, brief introduction. Uh, my name is Paula Uniak. Uh, I'm co-organizer for this panel. The, our sort of goal with this panel is to think about, you know, to, to look more at organizations themselves and how can they help foster equitable leadership and, you know, promote women into leadership positions and ensure their continued growth and, um, you know, progression through companies and through different types of organizations. So often it's easy to focus on just what, what can individuals do differently in managing their careers or in their approach at work, right? But we know that a huge part of what enables women in vulnerable, or sorry, women in different groups of populations who, you know, are often facing discrimination at work is that they are, you know, so much of the, um, of their ability to succeed or to not succeed is shaped by the sort of organizational practices and design and policies that are put into place. And so today we're going to talk about some ways that, you know, what, what do good policies and practices and organizations look like that foster equitable leadership? How can employees and organizations, you know, uh, work with their leadership or work with their fellow employees to sort of change the dynamics in a way that fosters leadership across the board. So we're going to get started with that. Uh, and I'm going to welcome our moderator, Jen Kim, to introduce herself and start introductions. Thanks, Paula. Hi. I'm coming from uh, tech startups. And um, most specifically, I was most recently at a startup called Lever, which is notable for having reached a milestone that's pretty rare in Silicon Valley. And we actually had a 50-50 men and women gender balance across the company. And that's including 50-50 in, uh, in the uh, management. I had joined four years ago as a first female employee when the company was real tiny and had a variety of roles, uh, most recently head of employee experience and development and was leading diversity and inclusion. Before that though, I was uh, working at the Stanford GSB and also for an education reform advocacy nonprofit startup. Um, so overall, I'm super passionate about building more inclusive organizations, making leadership more equitable, so really excited to be part of this conversation uh, with all of you and also with these uh, amazing accomplished women. Thank you. Hi, this is the nicest classroom I've ever been in. <laughs> This is insane. Um, my name's Lauren Nagel. I'm the group creative director at Pandora. Just a little music app down the street in Oakland, not the jewelry. Uh, <laughs> that's fine too, but, um, and what that means, what my role is at Pandora is I'm basically a part of the, the team that brings advertising to life on the Pandora platform. So looking at all of these different brands who want to partner with Pandora to tell their stories um, with our music on the platform. And I'm also the co-chair of our women's ERG, Pandora Women. Um, and I'm really, really excited to be here and happy to be talking to you all and honored to be on this panel with these fab ladies. So. Thanks for joining us. We're also going to talk about um, higher purpose. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're not missing anything. And like higher search. Search. search is higher search for regular purpose. <laughs> I met them like 20 minutes ago and like we're mic buddies and we're going to get coffee. This has been awesome. Um, my name is Danielle DeRyder Williams. I am the CEO of the Justice Collective. We are based in Oakland. We're an intersectional, cross-sectoral boutique consultancy. We focus on um, uh, supporting organizations and companies to become more equitable, inclusive, and improve, you know, and increase their impact in the world. Um, I, I was mentioning to them, since there's a lot of students here, uh, just share a little bit about uh, like my background and how I got into that before I pass it over to Annie. Um, I actually went to school for policy. Um, I got a master's in uh, urban planning at UCLA, and uh, I did a joint degree with an Afro-American studies program down there as well. Um, why that's relevant is because a lot of the theory and challenges that I was learning about in my Afro-American studies program 
are directly informing the work I do now um, with companies around uh, diversity and inclusion, right? So me learning and rooting my understanding of diversity and inclusion as an outcome of structural racism is the framework with which I start having that conversation. Um, so trying to solve diversity and inclusion um, uh, is, is actually stopping short of the fuller, um, the fuller picture. So I hope to, to dig a little bit deeper into that um, uh, with you all today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And hi, everyone. My name is Annie Sarter. I work for an organization called PLUS, Paid Leave for the US. We're an organization that has the single mission of winning paid family and medical leave for everyone in the United States. For those who don't know, paid family and medical leave includes the time that you can take to care for a newly. It also includes what we call family caregiving leave, if you have a, a seriously ill family member that you need to take care of. And it also includes personal medical leave. And we're the only industrialized nation in the world that does not have paid family leave. So we're going to change that. Um, I manage our workplace programs, which basically means working with companies to help them develop great paid family leave policies because business is going to play a really big role in helping us win the federal policy that we ultimately want in order to achieve our mission. Uh, I'm really excited to talk with everyone here and meet some of you because you all are the people who are going to be the leaders in the business community that um, need to be, that can show the leadership to help us win and to ensure that people have the time that they need to be with their families. So I'm thrilled to be here and thanks everyone. Cool, now that you know all of us, um, I was actually hoping to start with Lauren and just dive in. So Lauren has a super cool job at Pandora and I understand you are also leading a really large team, 50 people? Yeah, 50, 40, let's say 50, it's 50. <laughs> it's a large team. So maybe uh, tell us, um, you know, in your position and leading such a large team, how are you getting to champion these causes and uh, more equitable leadership? Yeah, I, you know, I think what's really interesting is that they're in organizations, in, in tech, but in organizations across the board, we're starting to see a lot more diversity and inclusion roles, right? There are a lot of these leadership positions in, in HR, um, sort of at, at the C level or at the senior leadership level. And while that is phenomenal, I'm, I started to notice that something was happening at Pandora where it was almost like diversity and inclusion issues just happened over there and it became um, a box that was sort of checked by the company for having that leadership position. And I was not super cool with that. And so um, I really recognized in my position of leading a large team and leading a large creative team. So very proud, only 11% of creative directors in advertising are women. Hi-o. Um, so th thanks. Um, so um, really recognized the, the unique position that I was in at Pandora and in the industry and started to do some um, sneaky stealth work <laughs> because basically, you know, I think that uh, if, for those of you who are just in Michelle Kim's session on allyship, which was phenomenal, thinking about what performative allyship is versus um, almost this concept or uh, a label that I like to use is really being an accomplice in this space. Um, how are we getting things done and how are folks actually perceiving me differently because I'm not in HR and what am I able to sort of get away with because I don't have that label and folks are actually listening to me in a different way. It was a different way of recognizing my own privilege in this space and using it to promote this sort of um, equitable leadership. And I think, again, there are all of these reasons why we're interested in this and all of the boxes we check about this being good. 
for me personally, and the way that Pandora as an organization looks at this is that um, we are a music platform. Music is incredibly diverse, and we aim to be as diverse as the product we're putting out into the world and as the listeners who are consuming that music. And so, especially in creative, even though I'm in the advertising space, there's even more reason to make sure that those stories are just as diverse as the storytellers and vice versa. So, um, I really started influencing this by changing my own personal practices as a leader and manager. Um, so for everyone in the room that is a Haas person, amazing. We don't look at education. Sorry. <laughs> so actually, when we hire, um, I don't see names. I don't see education. That's a way of, of, you know, sort of battling some of that unconscious bias. Not to say that your education isn't extremely valuable and you're all learning incredible, amazing stuff. Um, and the network there will, is fantastic um, and will arm you with all of the tools that you need to be amazing leaders in this space. Um, but I found, especially in creative, that, you know, these spaces of higher education, that's another privilege. And there was a whole sort of pipeline that I was missing because um, we were just looking at folks who had had the luxury, frankly, and the opportunity to have this, this sort of educational privilege. So um, it really has been through practices like this, recognizing that diversity and inclusion cannot be isolated to a diversity and inclusion role or an HR space if we really want to affect change. Another way, you don't have to be HR or diversity and inclusion in your title to really start championing it no matter what role you're in. Absolutely, and I might even argue respectfully, you may be able to get more done if you don't have a DNI title. That's not to say don't go into DNI, but I actually just found that there are ways we can partner together to get really great work done. Absolutely. Cool. I wanted to hear from uh, Danielle next. Um, so Danielle is doing some really cool work with the Justice Collective in that you're um, working across multiple sectors and industries, but for very similar goals. So maybe tell us about what you're seeing and what do you think are some kind of that organizational infrastructure that all these companies need for the goal? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'm going to end up echoing similarly some of the things that you just shared. Uh, so uh, one thing that we know is that organizations are really just individuals in the, in the aggregate, right? Um, so when we think about strategies that are effective in um, achieving equity goals or um, diversity inclusion goals, we have to work at multiple levels. Those levels include process and policy. Those levels include uh, the role that each of us as an individual hold, right? So that's individual um, goals and also our goals is inter interpersonal relationships, right? So when we think about what works across sectors, um, it, one of my biggest frustrations is that oftentimes each sector is only looking internally for their strategies and solutions. So you'll see tech um, will say, well, we need strategies that have, you know, that come out of the tech sector, as if uh, we're not all dealing with, the, again, the same larger structural inequities that are resulting in these diversity and inclusion outcomes. Um, so thinking about the ways in which organizations and companies can create sustainable infrastructure. So like, what does that look like, right? So that looks like, um, you know, to your point around, maybe there is a diversity inclusion team, but that's really not the only way. Um, and, and that isn't always the most effective way. Uh, so ensuring that uh, if there are folks in other functions that want to participate in advancing uh, equity efforts inside of a company or an organization, that they have uh, the bandwidth to do so, that they're resourced and supported in it, and that leadership recognizes the uh, absolute emotional toll right, emotional labor it is to lead efforts around equity, diversity, and inclusion, particularly for folks who are members of marginalized groups, right? Um, so if I were to say something, and you alluded to this earlier, it may be received differently um, than if Lauren were to say something. Experiencing that in the context of this work is really demoralizing and frustrating. So while simultaneously we have to think about ways to work together and collaborate, we also have to think about what do we need to remove and what structure and culture do we need to change so that that is not the case, 
right? Um, so where do we kind of insert, uh, you know, in, insert those efforts in the infrastructure? Another thing I'll mention is ensuring that leadership in the context of, an, of a company, so your, your higher ups um, and, and also your middle managers, because a lot of times diversity inclusion dies at the middle management level. Um, that they're not only engaged, because a lot of times leadership will say like, yeah, obviously we're committed to diversity. Of course equity is a priority for us, right? But one, they recognize what that really means. And two, they're prepared to be true advocates for it. Um, so that they have the vocabulary to not only be an ambassador for the work that you're doing, but also push back against resistance because it will happen. It's gonna happen, it's gonna happen all along the way, because you don't ever arrive there. You're, it's an ongoing journey, right? Um, so that they feel com comfortable kind of saying, okay, this is normal. This is something we might need to look at in terms of our strategy, but not doing the whole kind of knee-jerk reaction when the little, uh, you know, a little bit of resistance pops up. So I would say kind of ensuring and resourcing uh, uh, folks who are doing the work inside the organization and, and simultaneously making sure that your leadership is, is on board in a, in a, in a real way. Cool, thank you. I think it's a good reminder for keeping this kind of work really holistic and sustainable sense and not just necessarily checking the boxes or what's being done right now today. All right, so we wanted to go to Annie next. So Annie is also doing really interesting work in that you're taking this approach in a very focused way, one issue, but it's one that really impacts all of us. So if there's any uh, folks who are not sure about what paid leave means and its significance, do you mind starting with some basics and why is this so important? Uh, well, I would love to, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, building on what Lauren and Danielle have said, um, paid family leave is a very specific example of one policy that a company can implement that can, um, that can really help move a company's policies and also culture forward in terms of achieving diversity and inclusion goals. And I can give some examples. So, you know, there's, there's great studies that we have on, you know, recruiting and retaining employees if you have a great policy, especially here in the Bay Area where the job market is so hot. What we're seeing is so many companies just have to have these fantastic policies if they're going to compete at all, um, which is frankly wonderful. <laughs> um, but there's also, you know, very real, it's also very real when you look sort of up and down in organizations. So you achieve your same recruitment and retention goals for high level executives. Also that's true for people say working a cashier counter. Um, a company can really um, boost its numbers where it wants to boost its numbers in diversity and inclusion when you have great policies that are re retaining people. And it gets really simple when you realize person has given birth two weeks ago, they might not be fantastic at their job, right? So building a policy that allows for a person and their family um, to exist uh, alongside a, a workplace, um, I think just at the end of the day makes a lot of sense. Another specific example that I really like to think about is in terms of family caregiving leave. So. There's interesting work that is being ha that is happening around helping companies better understand what they mean by family. And when you write a policy, there is an opportunity to expand your definition of family to include chosen family or grandparents or family that is uh, you know, one degree away from this, I think somewhat fictional nuclear family that we all sort of see as normal, right? Um, and when companies do this, you are becoming more accessible and more inclusive to LGBT families, to people who live in a more non-traditional family structure, um, and it's, it's simple, and it can be a very simple language tweak that um, can have big impacts on a workforce. Cool. I just wanted to go back to something that Lauren said at the top of her intro. So she's uh, leading the Pandora Women, the mm -hmm. ERG. 
Uh, raise your hand if you know what an ERG is and what it stands for. Okay, we've got half the room. Cecilia. Acronyms that you pretend to know what they are. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about what that is. Mm -hmm. um, so Lauren, tell us about Pandora Women and how that works and how that's impacting Pandora. Yeah, so okay, employee resource group. I only learned that from doing stuff like this and then saying, yeah, I totally know what that is and then asking what that was. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, so Pandora Women. Pandora has three community groups. They're called at Pandora. Pandora Mixtape for our communities of color. Get it? Music? Adorable. Uh, Pandora Pride uh, and Pandora Women. And Pandora Women um, was started years before I was at Pandora. I've actually been at Pandora for seven years, which is um, like, yeah, it's like a hundred tech dog years. <laughs> it's a long time. Um, and I started as a co production coordinator there and now lead this team of 50 uh, creatives. Um, and there was a women in business organization at Pandora I'm so grateful that it was started early on by some of our early earliest senior women. Jessica Steele, who actually now is the president at Urban Sitter, was an early executive at Pandora and started the Women in Business Group. And it was mostly run by senior women. Um, senior women recognizing the opportunity that they had, that they wanted to uh, connect with the rest of the Pandora uh, female population, folks identifying as female, and really um, bring a lot of interesting programming into the space and sort of like many of the conversations today, it's sort of what happens after that hiring step, how are we retaining, how are we promoting, how are we uh, growing and evolving, and Pandora Women was a part of that. However, and I don't know if um, any of you have had this experience, I would walk by a flyer for something that said Pandora Women and I would think, well, I work at Pandora, and I'm a woman, but that's probably not for me. Uh, and I just had this strange aversion to it, and I wasn't really sure why. And part of it was that when I started attending some of the programming, the energy of the space itself, it would be programming about amplifying women's voices, and everyone would walk into the room really respectful and no one would talk to each other, and we're a music company, it would be very silent. And then we would have uh, programming that was around dress for the job that you want, not the job you have, and all the, and, and it was just like, this doesn't feel like it represents the energy of the women that I know and, and love and am honored to work alongside. And um, I actually went to the TED Women Conference about three years ago, was so inspired by um, an environment much like this, rooms uh, where the majority are women, which I think is very rare for, for many of us to even just experience what that is like. Um, and I wanted to bring that energy back into the Pandora space. I wanted to bring, I mean, I know I'm in creative, so it's like the energy of the room matters, the typeface matters, the design matters. Like, how are we making sure that how we're representing this type of programming truly is inclusive and inviting and represents the energy of all of the powerful women we wanted involved? So um, I really just raised my hand and started doing the work and have been, uh, you know, it's all on top of the day job as many of us do, um, but it's, it's passion. I believe that, you know, culture really happens at this intersection of passion and purpose. And if we can find that and activate it in our role, much more um, than what we might be doing in the day to day. So I really was inspired by that energy and wanted to bring it uh, to my Pandora and to, tech into music and media, and now to y'all. No big deal. Yeah, I'm feeling inspired, yeah. <laughs> that sounds like uh, Pandora's taking a really unique approach because you were part of that culture and you got to build Pandora, help build Pandora Women with accordance to what's unique for Pandora. Absolutely, I think that's important, right? This isn't a one size fits all. And it's also extremely important to me that many women in business organizations are for white women. They are, that's how this kind of fourth wave of feminism has, has shown up. Um, and so really paying attention to, I mean, we just had a company meeting where, actually we just had a company meeting where I opened the whole thing. This is 2,300 employees 
in offices across the entire country. And I opened the whole meeting by saying, vaginas, am I right? True story. True story. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, and then vagina, hashtag vagina icebreaker was trending on Twitter and blind. It's one of my proudest moments. Um, no, so I think this is all just to say there is an authenticity factor. I think that we feel as we're growing in our roles and our leadership or when we take on identities within these um, employee resource groups, we have to somehow fit into a box that is, I am now a woman in business. I am now a, a female leader. Um, I loved what Larissa was saying around like really finding the authenticity as a leader and I think that's so important. So identifying what does the women's group um, look like for you, for your company and, and really playing into that authenticity for yourself because you'll get so much more out of it and I think it will be so much more successful. Yeah, you gave me the perfect segue to the next question which mm -hmm. is for Danielle. So even though today's conversation is about women in leadership, you know, Diversity and inclusion, all initiatives really have to be mindful of intersectionality. And again, if you don't know what that is, that's totally okay because I'm going to ask Danielle to tell us. I was going to define it anyway. <laughs> yeah, tell us what it is. I already wrote like. it down. No. <laughs> tell us how we should be mindful of intersectionality and how organizations should be more mindful of it. Yeah. Um, raise your hand if you know what intersectionality is. Okay. Awesome. Um, so for those who don't, uh, I'll give you a quick and dirty definition. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a law professor, coined the term to describe uh, when one is situated at um, uh, the intersection of multiple identities and oftentimes multiple marginalized identities. So myself as a black woman, I am a woman, I am black. Um, I also have an in invisible disability. Um, uh, so having that intersection means that uh, solutions uh, that are kind of uh, developed out of what tends to be, uh, to your, you know, to, to underscore your point, uh, uh, for white women, um, and, and really which is kind of situated in a larger like white patriarchal uh, development development anyway, so that's a whole other conversation that we can have at the reception later, um, uh, don't necessarily work for folks who have intersecting identities, right? Um, so that has implications in, in terms of, uh, you know, an organization um, and in terms of how individuals in the organization are able to thrive, uh, have their voices heard, create change. Um, so, you know, one thing I think a lot about, uh, particularly, you know, as, as someone who represents uh, multiple identities is the ways in which organizations uh, can begin to uh, reshape or reconsider or reorient what leadership looks like or what it means to be a business person or what it means to be a serious professional. One of the things we're most proud of at the Justice Collective is really rooting ourselves in our authenticity, um, really kind of it is, it is what it is, we are who we are, we're bringing this rich um, understanding of the world because nothing is cut and dry, right? So being able to have that conversation from the point of like, this is who I am, these are the identities that I'm bringing. Um, I don't actually have all the answers because there is no one size fits all approach. Um, so within the context of organizations, ensuring that uh, you create opportunities for folks who don't represent the kind of typical leader to be at the table, right? Uh, having inclusive decision making processes are essential organizational strategies within inside companies, um, nonprofits, and, and within inside government. Uh, oftentimes, irrespective of the solution that is a or the decision that's made, if the process is inclusive, you'll often have a lot better reception. So you may end up with the same decision, um, but you've included people along the way, right? So that's like a really important strategy. Um, another important strategy um, is ensuring that uh, you believe people's experiences. And that's a key um, part of intersectionality. So um, uh, in, in some of my other work um, with the planning department in San Francisco, I'm a part of a larger cohort, a small cohort of people who are doing racial equity work there. And um, uh, they have all developed over the course of the last couple of years a vocabulary and a deeper understanding about racial equity. What this means for me is that when something happens to me as an individual inside of this organization, I, can, I have at least 10 other people that I can look to and say, am I crazy, did that just happen? And they can say, no, I saw it too, right? 
believing people's experiences has a direct impact on the other strategies that you create um, and generate for more inclusive and equitable organizations. So believing people's experiences is, is really key. Um, and then, you know, one other thing I would kind of mention, and, and this goes back to this larger framework that, um, you know, that, that I approach all this DNI work from um, around uh, the structure and the larger culture that we live in in the world that we live in is pay attention to what's going on in the world that's affecting marginalized groups inside of your organization. Has anyone heard the phrase calling off black? Raise your hand if you have. Well, of course you have. Uh, those are my business partners. I planted them in the audience. Uh, so, um, I'll give you a really quick personal example of this. Um, uh, this summer, um, Philando Castile's murder was acquitted. So it was another police murder. The police officer was acquitted. Uh, I had Mike, uh, the app, news alerts on my phone. And I was sitting in a leadership development training all day thing. And we had just come back from lunch. And my phone's sitting on the table. And it's on silent. But I look down and I have this news alert that this officer had been acquitted. Now, someone else's murder had been acquitted the month before that and the month before that. But for whatever reason, on that day, it hit me like I was like gutted. I felt nauseous, right? I was immediately upset. Uh, one of the uh, one of my colleagues who had been in this racial equity work with me over the last couple of years noticed something was going on with me, um, and I like showed her my phone, and then I went outside, um, and she texted me and she said, "Do you need anything?" And I said, "Water." Um, so she she came out and she brought me water and she just sat with me. She didn't you know say like, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I, this is awful. I feel bad too." She's, she's a white woman. Um, she just sat there. She rubbed my back, right? Um, us having created within inside that organization the opportunity for her to build her empathy and capacity and her emotional intelligence as an individual opened up the door for her to be a good ally to me. For her to now pay attention to what's going on in the world and recognize the impact of larger society and what that has on, on people. Versus it being like, well, I mean, we're in the middle of this training. You should stay here or whatever, right? So her kind of seeing that in me and also me taking that time for myself. So for folks of color and other marginalized groups here, I also want to say, like, take care of yourself. Uh, and if people question whether or not you should be taking care of yourself, then you should be somewhere else. And I definitely mean that. Um, so I'll stop there. But those are just some things that come up for me. No, what a great story. Thanks for sharing. I mean, just a great reminder for how all of us can play a part here. OK, and then uh, one more question for Annie. Um, so PLUS is taking a really unique approach in employee advocacy. So as I understand it, you're providing workshops and resources to really equip, uh, to really equip different individual employees to go and actually persuade their employers for stronger family leave policies. Can you actually tell us how this works and what this looks like? Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to. Um, I'll start with a little, a little story. So um, at PLUS, we, we started our work with the private sector a little, maybe a year and a half ago, and we published the paid family leave policies at the biggest, the 60 biggest employers in the country on our website. And it was the first time this information had been transparently posted all together in one easy to find place. Um, and it was really exciting. We were all, we were moving forward. And really quickly after we published this information, we got a phone call from a group of women who were mid-level executives at Starbucks. And they said, we actually, we're so glad to be in touch with you. We are working to expand the paid family leave policy at Starbucks, and can you help us? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And forwarded over you know, all the resources that I can put together on why great policies are so important, and the business case for great policies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, pretty quickly, they had been working for a while, um, pretty quickly, Starbucks, with great fanfare and a really impressive PR push, <laughs> published a fantastic policy. It was a parental leave policy 
12 weeks for all new parents plus an additional six weeks if you give birth. It, it, it's groundbreaking, right? Only for people who are in the corporate office, not for the baristas, not for 97% of their staff. <laughs> So we call, you know, called the group and said, you know, congratulations, you made a great first step, now let's work to expand this. And they were not interested. They stopped answering my phone calls. Um, so when we think about how, you know, leaders <laughs> in business can advocate for marginalized communities, this is a really key way um, we went in to team up with some really fun and amazing baristas, and they ended up winning access to paid family leave for themselves just earlier this year, which was really an honor to work with them. Um, but in the intervening months, we at PLUS realized that there was a real need. There's a lot of people who are mid-level executives, to Lauren's point, um, who are advocating for change inside of their institutions. and can be really effective. And while HR is a center for a lot of power on diversity and inclusion, people outside of HR can do a lot. And we've put together a workshop, we call it the Family Leave Workshop. It's on our website, you can sign up. <laughs> uh, and what we created was, well we started by interviewing people who had successfully changed paid family leave policies at their own workplaces and we found that they were all generally following about the same process. They were reaching out to their ERG or creating an ERG. They were collecting testimonials from people or coworkers of people who needed paid family leave and why. They were putting together a proposal. They were negotiating with their executive team. So we wrote up that process into a toolkit, which is available on our website. We drafted a example policy, which would be a great policy, for people to propose to their own leadership teams so that all of these hundreds of people across the country aren't all starting from zero, writing their own policy. They can now start from something that already exists. Um, and we do these workshops about once a month, and we also partner with other, usually business associations. One that we recently did that I can shout out as a good example <laughs> is uh, Women in um, Renewable Energy Technology have a business association. And we've worked with dozens of them who represent uh, dozens of renewable energy companies and are now starting to click away at winning new paid family leave policies and they're having great success and it's such a pleasure to work with them. So it can be really fun. Diversity and inclusion, it can be really fun. <laughs> and if you don't do it right, Annie will put you on blast on a panel. <laughs> Starbucks, Yeah. What? <laughs> I have a little list. <laughs> Okay, so uh, question for everybody. We're talking a lot about both success strategies and maybe some barriers to uh, equitable leadership. Any other things that come up? Any other things that you've seen in your work? You can both hold them. I'm cheating on my mic buddy over here. Uh, yeah, uh, barriers. Um, so, um, time, right? Uh, I, I, I watched a panel at a, a tech company I won't name, because um, I'm not Annie. Uh, and there were uh, several folks who were uh, the coordinators or leaders of their own employee resource groups. And uh, what they kept mentioning is like, I know I wasn't hired to do this, and you know, I know this isn't my, my job, um, uh, and, 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 right? And what struck me in, in watching them kind of describe their participation in this is that uh, we actually have to start shift, shifting our thinking that advancing equity, diversity, inclusion inside of companies and organizations is absolutely part of your job. So what does that look like in practice? Um, uh, if you start to look at um, performance reviews, 
is there a, um, a category that you can add that speaks to how you as an individual have worked to advance equity, diversity, and inclusion with inside your company? Um, that's a really kind of simple way to institutionalize a standard um, across the board, right? Uh, particularly when you couple that with appropriate kind of skills building, capacity building for employees within the company. So kind of, you know, it's kind of chicken and the egg, like you can't just say like, you need to be advancing this and then like people are like, well how, right? So if you can couple that with some, some skills building, capacity building for them to understand what their role is and where equity opportunities are, are situated from, from their perspective, and then tracking that across the organization or the company. That's one way to kind of move the needle in all these uh, spaces, small and large, um, which will kind of get you headed in the right direction. And it starts to really recognize and honor the time that it takes to move stuff like that forward so that it's not just the extracurricular or I'm getting additional visibility. Like, you know, how does this, how is this reflected in my performance that then can have real monetary benefits, can and should have real monetary benefits. Um, so that's one barrier is time. Um, I might say too, to, to add on that, that I, I don't think we have to wait for the organization uh, in order to start implementing some of these things as individuals. So while there, there's been, I love um, the idea of how can we add this uh, element to our evaluations, um, something we talk about a lot uh, talk about a lot at Pandora is if we as a community start volunteering this as our own hits of the year, as our own, I did really well on this. And it's not so that your, um, you know, it's super important to understand what is your company value, what is your manager value when you show up and you say this is an accomplishment, you want to mirror what your, what your, you know, manager thinks is an accomplishment. But it's also super important to know that you can start shifting that conversation. And if you start listing your own leadership in diversity and inclusion, or just the skills that make you you and a unique leader, um, as a woman, as an individual, as an introvert, um, let's pay attention to different styles of leadership, and you start listing them as your own accomplishments, we'll actually see that tide turn without needing to wait for that coming from leadership and trickling down. Um, so I know we've, we've sort of throughout the day has been this wonderful progression of where does it start as an individual and how do we evolve and now we're talking about um, and at this at the organizational level but echoing exactly what you said, we're an aggregate of individuals and there's a lot that we can do as individuals um, to start turning that tide without waiting for our leadership to do it. And then you'll be, then you are the leadership, right? As we, yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, so then one final question for the group before we move into the Q and A. So here we are addressing a room full of amazing future and current uh, female leaders and allies. Any advice you'd like to impart on both professional success, but also being part of fostering a more inclusive culture? Anybody want to start? Sure. I can start just, I think, by echoing your sentiment just a moment ago. I think, I think, or maybe Danielle said it. I think, I think it's all, it's everyone's job who's in leadership to lift others up. And I think that that's really important and serious. And I think it's easy to, to forget. Um, but when, when you th are thinking about a key element of your role is to advocate for people who are not in your position, um, I think that's where change happens. Boss me. I'm an, I'm inviting I'm an only you. child. I'm inviting you. Okay, well, <laughs> my identity as an only child received that as bossing me. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, everything she said. And um, I think a lot about, again, this connection between sectors and how it's really easy to kind of burrow in and think that uh, you can only kind of look to the sector that you're in to. Um, you know, to, to, 
to, to do your work. Um, I, I think if I could kind of leave uh, one thing or a couple things is, you know, one, do your homework. So one of the biggest challenges that we face in, in advancing equity work in the context of organizations and companies is folks own implicit and individual biases. Uh, where do those come from? Those come from our larger society that teaches us these things from the time that we're born, right? So we're literally trying to undo centuries of inculcation around racism and sexism and um, uh, homophobia, transphobia, right? Like all, all of these things, right? So what that then means is, to echo what you said, we all have an individual role and responsibility to deepen our understanding about what this world does to bodies and the minds of people who are members of marginalized groups. Uh, so for white folks, that means understanding and becoming an anti-racist uh, uh, white person, right? Uh, and that's a hard process. It's ongoing. My mom's white and, and she's amazing and she still trips up sometimes. And I'm not talking about on the like, white supremacist spectrum of the KKK, but there are ways in which, you know, uh, uh, we all trip up, right? So, so, so for white folks, deeply invest in decolonizing your mind and understanding around issues of race. And it is deep work and it is hard work, right? Uh, for folks of color, take care of yourself. I'm just like, do not martyr yourself for the cause of trying to save us from our from ourselves, right? So I think about uh, the election down in Alabama. Where did what's the session's seat? Where was that? Alabama. Yeah. So like, black women saved the whole thing, right? Don't feel like you need to do that. Actually, we need to stop doing that. We need to stop saving America from itself. So for for <laughs> for people of color, for women of color, um, for black women, and I, I say that as, as this is a black woman. Uh, take care of yourself. Um, and do not martyr yourself for something that will like cut you off at the knees at the at the quickest chance it can get. Um, so yeah, I'll end there. Real light work. Oh, Real light. Crazy. So good. I I think um, just really quickly what what I would add to that is that I think um, as women we are constantly balancing between this place of recognizing what work we need to do what work we need to keep doing and feeling confident that you are enough. Let that land for a second. I gave, I just got goosebumps. I gave myself goosebumps. <laughs> really, I'm so humble, I'm really moving myself. Uh, it's just ridiculous. Um, that, uh, I just took away from this moment. Um, <laughs> I just, I think that's a really challenging space to balance because we're constantly going, we are students uh, of life, there are these incredibly challenging issues, there are all of these opportunities we need to dig in on, and I think it can feel like there's too much, or I'm never going to make it, or I'm never going to know, or I'm never going to be enough, or I'm never going to be that leader or whatever, the, all the nevers, all of the shoulds start piling up. And then at the same time, um, the fact that we are all sitting in this room together is just at the very least an indication that uh, you're doing great. <laughs> We're doing great work. And how do you stay in that space of knowing that what you inherently bring to the table as yourself is enough and keep doing the work? Wow, really powerful stuff. So we're going to go into the open Q&A. Actually, unfortunately, oh, everyone, we have time, we have time limits, um, so we need to end there. Um, but I'd like to lead a real round of applause for our amazing panelists. Um, but I know that everyone is really bursting with questions because there were so many fascinating things that were brought up here and so many important stories and areas of work to move forward on, so I encourage you to, you know, get at your amazing panelists here, send in, you know, send your questions, crowd them right now, and then together make your way over to Anderson <laughs> in the other building. <laughs>